Brethren, we are in Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6 is talking about the conquest of Jericho. It's interesting because Jericho did come up in the message in the first session. So um, Joshua is giving instructions to the soldiers as they breach the wall and enter into the, into the city. He says in verse 17, well, I'll start with verse 16. And it came to pass at the seventh time of the seventh blast of the trumpets, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord hath given you the city and the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein to the Lord, first to the Lord, as far as the Lord is concerned, is cursed. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, and she's the one that has the red string on her hand, so only those that are living out of the blood of Jesus shall live. You can have the blood in you and not be living out of it, the blood of Jesus is the white drop. You can have the white drop, but if you're living out of the red drop, you're not covered. See? And if you're in sin, if you're in sin, you're living out of the red drop. Because what does it mean to be in sin? It means that you are in agreement with the red drop, okay, that separated from Elohim and became Satan and the devil, the devil, which is your fallen nature and your carnal mind. You're in agreement with your fallen nature and your carnal mind. So even if you have the white drop, you may be capable of preaching a great message, but your consciousness, your mind, your soul is married to the red drop if you have not given up the cursed object. So it's possible, it's a paradox that you can preach repentance and be in sin because you refuse to give up the accursed object. And the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. In other words, she's in agreement with the white drop. Or the, the son and the daughter of the white drop, the, 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 that part of the five elements of the Tetragrammaton that entered in first. She's in agreement with them. She's has, she has rejected the thoughts and perceptions of the red drop, which is her own ego, and is embracing and in agreement with the thoughts and perceptions and morality of the white drop. So you can have both. We always have the red drop. We're born with the red drop. So having the white drop is not enough. You have to live out of it. And ye in any wise keep yourselves, brethren, and ye in it, because it's your city that's being breached, okay? The mother and the father, the higher, the mother and the father representing the, oh, how do I say this? The, 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 the mother and the father are entering in, the father through esoteric doctrine and the mother through understanding is entering into your city, which is breaking up your city. What does that mean, breaking up your city, okay? It means that, okay, it's breaking up, okay, this goes round and round. When the mother and the father move in, okay, enter in, it means that Cain is reversing to Abel and the son of man is being born, okay, and the son of man is in agreement with the mother and the father, which is breaking up the unification or the marriage of your personality and the red drop. So the personality is supposed to be resisting the sins of the red drop. When you come in agreement with the sins of the red drop, which is your own mind and your own morality and your own justification, okay, okay, um, um, uh, then you are the city that's being, uh, you, you will be broken up, you will be destroyed with the city, okay? What's happening when you're in, in submission to Jesus is the white is the personality is being liberated from the red drop and we are being changed internally and ultimately will be changed physically okay 
our body, our DNA will change and be able to live hundreds of years when the fullness of the tetragrammaton is being revealed in this world through our city. It will change our DNA. Okay, just like Cain will change back to Abel as we agree with the, the perceptions of the white drop and reject the perceptions of the red drop. And for a season, we can go back and forth. But as we agree with the perceptions of the red drop, the power of God starts to diminish in us. And we start to lose the anointing. That was Tony's dream of this morning, that the anointing was leaking, okay? The anointing was seeping out and leaking. And when you're in sin, you don't see this happening. You never, you never see it until you wake up in the pig pen. But you start to lose the anointing immediately. Okay. What does that mean? It means that your agreement with the white drop is diminishing. Your agreement with the red drop is strengthening. The, whatever you have of the Son of Man is, is, is dying. And you don't see it because of the of the pleasure that sin is giving you for a season. One day you wake up and the anointing is completely gone. So don't be deceived, brethren, that you think you're okay because you preach a powerful message today because I have witnessed it in gospel revivals, an incredible outpouring of the spirit. Okay? And the next day, gone. And it never came back. Uh, so, and ye in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when you take the accursed thing. And you also not only make yourself accursed, but you make the camp of Israel a curse and you cause it to be troubled. You make trouble for the whole camp of Israel. But all the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And so the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets and it came to pass. When the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass, with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath as ye swear unto her. That's the personality that's going to be saved. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had, and they brought out all with her, out all her kindred, and left them outside the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and gold and vessels of brass and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So this kindred, Rahab is, Rahab is the personality. And her father and her mother and her brethren, what that represents is the, is the red drop. Brethren, when we, when we reject the red drop and, and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the white drop, okay, the, the configuration of our, our whole mindset breaks up and changes, our heart changes, and Cain becomes able, mm -hmm. and the devil and Satan revert back, okay, to the to the holy red drop, and they flow to and they flow together with the white drop. Mm -hmm. There's no communion or union between the, the the spirit and seed of the white drop and the spirit and seed of the red drop when the red drop has its back to the white drop. Okay? But repentance on the part of the personality and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ forces the red drop, it, it, it strips the red drop of its power. So it forces the red drop to turn around and face the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the spirit flows together 
and the sea flows together and the son of man comes into existence. So that's what was saved for Rahab, her whole city, her personality and the red drop and her body, her, their body, the body also. So when I talk about the body dying as a judgment, please don't misunderstand me. You know, I'm not pronouncing death on anybody. We all die a natural death eventually. The person that will not die a natural death is the person that's different. And we may not know that we're in that state until we, until we stay young and vibrant as our body ages. And they burned the city with fire. Wow. And Joshua saved Rahab, the harlot, alive, and her father's household, and all that she had, and she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers. She welcomed the white drop, which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and buildeth this city of Jericho. And that Jericho is in all of us. What could you turn that heat up a little for me? Jericho inside of us is the city, is the spiritual city that comes into existence when we, the personality, agree with the, with the perceptions, the thoughts, the justifications for our sin of the carnal mind, which is Satan and the devil. We build a city, okay? What does that mean? There's an offspring, there's a child that's born, and that child is Cain. And Cain buries Abel. And, and we, the whole turn our back on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what withdraws from us. I honestly don't know if it's, it, I honestly, I, I know that the, the mother and the, and the father would withdraw, whether the son and the daughter withdraw also, I don't know. I don't know, but they, they might, because that was the dream this morning that the anointing was pouring out. And the Tony's dream this morning was that the water was leaking because the, um, the device had fallen over, was no longer upright. Okay, is in sin, and um, and so he couldn't turn off. He couldn't stop the water from leaking. And then he remembered that there was a a device in the attic. So he went upstairs. In other words, the person that Tony typified in the dream petitioned the Lord Jesus Christ to shut off the to stop the the dissipation of the anointing, but it couldn't be turned off because. You can pray day and night, you can fast, you can do the whole nine yards. And nothing, God's ears are closed to you unless and until you repent. And repentance is witnessed to by the relinquishing of the cursed object and nothing else will do. No begging, no crying, no strong tears, no fasting, no praying, nothing. You have to give up the cursed object we want to stop the loss of the anointing, which has already begun. Don't be deceived, let me see it one moment. So, cursed be the man uh, before the Lord. What does it mean before the Lord? That word before it means in the personality of the Lord. Cursed be the man that's in the personality of the Lord. Cursed be the man that that is manifesting the the, the the, the image, not a physical image, but speaking the words and, and, and manifesting the, the, the mindset of God. Cursed be the man before the Lord. And that Lord is, that's tetragrammaton. Cursed be the man that's speaking the words of God you know, and rebuilds that city, rebuilds his unification with the red drop. That's what sin is. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So someone did do it eventually. I never did that study, but someone did rebuild Jericho. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. Okay, chapter 7, Joshua. 
chapter 7. But, but, after that great victory, the children of Israel committed a trespass concerning the accursed thing that they were warned about. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zebodi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. So that's, there were, there were two twins, Pharaoh and Zerah. The monarchy descended from Pharaoh's. This is the, according to the scriptures, Zerah was born first. Sarah was born first, and then he was overcome in the womb by Pharaoh's, and Pharaoh's was born. Pharaoh's put his, uh, Zerah put his, as a, as a fetus, put his hand out. And then Pharaoh's in the womb dragged him back in and was born first. We're, the, we're all experiencing this. It's happening in us, okay? Who, who's, who was born first? Abel was born first, but Cain overtook him. Pulled him back into the womb, well, pulled Abel back into the woman is now living through all of humanity. See? And it's happening now. As the white drop, and if you're a believer and the white drop has entered into your life, and you've seen signs and wonders, and, and you've known the power of God, and, and you recognize the word of God to come, of the, of the word of God of the world to come, and you've tasted all of this goodness, and then you willfully sin. You choose to sin. You, 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 you're not seduced. You, cho you choose to sin. Okay. What has happened is that Pharaoh's in you okay, has pulled Zerah back into the womb. Cain in you has risen up and pulled Abel, put Abel under the ground, and Cain is now the predominant consciousness in you. And the fact that you can still preach a good message doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. So, we see a Jew from the tribe of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took the accursed thing. So we see, we see a, a, um, a character flaw. In the, in the tribe of Judah, in the family of Zerah. Now, obviously, there were character flaws in the tribe of Pharaohs, and we talked about that on Thursday, how, uh, how uh, David sinned with Bathsheba, cursed the whole nation of Israel. If you follow, if you follow, the, if you follow far enough through the generations, Solomon's sin, uh, David's sin, okay, resulted in Jehovah... Uh, uh, compensating Bathsheba by putting her son on the throne. So a flawed, a flawed monarch took the throne to replace David. It ended in the division, in civil war, in the division of Israel into two parts and the ultimate destruction of the Davidic monarchy in the flesh. The destruction of the Davidic monarchy in the flesh continues in the spirit through the Lord Jesus Christ. King. He's king. How is he king? Jesus Christ is king of the, of, of the kingdoms. He's my king. You serve him. He's your king. king. He's a spiritual king. And he comes to dwell in me and sit on the throne of my heart. See? And that was how the, the, the hearts of those men that were talking to Jesus on the road to Emmaus, their hearts were burning in them. What it meant was that the glorified Jesus Christ had entered into their hearts see, and was, and was uh, burning with the, with the, boiling with the life of God. See. That's how he's king. And I told you, king, that's the 10th sephir. The 10th sephir called Malkuth, the female. She's called king, but she's the part of the Godhead that enters into the body. The 10th separate, she is the part of the Godhead that enters into the body that sits on the heart, the heart. It manifests in your heart, but it's really in the unconscious part of your mind and rules over the whole kingdom, which is the whole person. That's how he, that's how he's my king. <laughs> that's how he is my king. The 10th separate of the Lord Jesus Christ dwells with me, 
as a man dwells with his wife. So that's how he's my king. And I'm his city and I'm his kingdom. And he's promised all of the kingdoms of the world. And he will marry all of the kingdoms of the world. Because that is the will of his father. So a son from the tribe of, of the family of the tribe of Judah, the family of Zerah, took the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So I believe that's why Brooke perceived the man came into the building before I did today. Christ Jesus is covering the sin of this one person, or, or the wrath of God would be on the whole ministry. Christ Jesus walked into this room before me, covering the sin or the wrath of God would be on the whole ministry. What does that mean? Most likely the meeting would have been canceled today. No message, would, unless I preached out of my own spirit. It would have interfered with the word of God that's preached by Christ Jesus coming forth now. So now if it's Christ Jesus that preaches all the time here, a higher authority than Christ Jesus came in before him to cover the anointing here. Who's that? The Lord Jesus Christ himself. Why? Because the man of the household, which is in me, okay, was able to sustain the faithfulness of his wife, which, which is me. I'm still in agreement with Christ Jesus. So it becomes, it's interesting because on a recent message, either Thursdays or last Sundays, I talked about, I talked about um, uh, God sending Moses in the name of I am to get the Hebrew children out of Israel. Because I said Jehovah wasn't strong enough to, to, to deliver the Hebrew children. Well, that sounds terrible if you don't know what I'm talking about. Of course, God is all powerful. You need to understand what I'm saying. Jehovah in Moses, okay, Jehovah in the people, okay, was overcome. Jehovah in the people was turned, okay. And, and of course it was, I'm sorry, it wasn't even Jehovah in the people, it was the it was this, it was Abraham's seed, okay, that was in the people that was crying out because the Hebrew children, because the spiritual part of that seed was serving the gods of Egypt. The seed, the one who brings the doctrine, was crying out to Jehovah because his mother, the spiritual side of that seed, okay, was joining to and worshiping the gods of Egypt. So the red seed, or at least half of the red seed, okay, or I don't know, maybe it was the whole red seed, but maybe they were maybe they were faithful people. You can't divide them. So maybe there were faithful believers in Egypt that were crying out to Jehovah. Like we cry out from here, look at what's happened to the church. So I think I have to go with that. Because you can't divide the spirit from the sea. So the majority of the of the of the um, Hebrew children were worshiping the gods of Egypt, but there was a, a faithful remnant that was crying out to Jehovah. Look at what's happened to the Israelite community. Okay. And they and this remnant knew the promises that were made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God sent Moses, okay, because the, 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 the seed, Abraham's seed, is a white drop. Okay? Every human being is born with a red drop. Anything that's added to us is the white drop. So when Jehovah gave Abraham a seed, it was the red drop. It was given initially just to Israel. Now it's given to the whole church and to whosoever will, okay? So it was Abraham's seed in the Hebrew children because their red drop, and in some cases the white drop, well, the red drop was, the, the, the spiritual side of the red drop was given over to the gods of Egypt and they had covered over the white drop. The white drop was not strong enough to rescue the Hebrew children that were unrepentantly worshiping the gods of Egypt. Let me say it again. Abraham's seed in the majority of the Israelites, of the Hebrew children, I don't think they were Israelites yet, the majority of the, of, the, of the Hebrew children in Egypt 
had given over their red seed. Okay, they, they, they had given over. I'm sorry, I'm going to do this in Jesus' name. They had given over their red their red seed. Okay, their humanity, their carnality, to the gods of Egypt, and the white seed that was present in them, the white drop that was present in them, was not strong enough to overcome that white. Because the, the personalities of the Hebrew children chose the perceptions of the red drop, which were worshiping the gods of Egypt, and they rejected the perceptions of the white drop, which were saying, that's idolatry, sir, God. Can I get that out? So, so Jehovah had to send someone to deliver the Hebrew children that was stronger than, than, the, than the personality ego of the Hebrew children that would join to the gods of Egypt. That was a, a powerful force. And Jehovah and Moses would not have been, Jehovah and Moses, not Jehovah, the general Jehovah that wasn't strong enough. He sent a messenger, Jehovah and Moses, was on a, a, the Hebrew, the, 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 the uh, Egyptian gods were so ascended that they were on a level of power of Jehovah in Moses. And Moses was headed for the battle in sin, taking his wife with him. <laughs> so I am came and interfered, delivered Moses from his sin gave him a higher anointing than the gods of Egypt that were, that were the gods of Egypt were in the Hebrew children. So Moses went to Egypt and overthrew the spiritual power of the Hebrew children, of the gods of Egypt and the Hebrew children. And how did he do that? He brought them under judgment. That, those were the Hebrew children that went under judgment, brethren. Those 10 plagues were for the Hebrew children. They were worshiping the gods of Egypt. He brought them out with judgment. So Carmi, and so Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zim. Zebdi, son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took the accursed thing. Well, what was it? I'm not going to find out what it was. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against all of Israel. That's what it says. One man, Achan, took the accursed thing, and the anger of Tetragrammaton, Jehovah, was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Beth El, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. See, they went up not even knowing that Jehovah was mad at them. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Don't let the people go up. But let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So they went up thither of, of the people, about three thousand men. And they fled before the men of Ai, so they received one counsel. What does that mean? Listen, listen. Listen. And the anger of Jehovah was kindled against the children of Israel. Nobody knows it, see? So something has to happen to make us know that God's angry. And Joshua sent men, trusted men, from Jericho, soldiers that just won this great supernatural battle to Ai. And he spake unto them, saying, go up and view the country and bring back a reconnaissance report. What do we need to take the city? And the men came back, verse 3, and said unto him, we don't need the whole army. We don't need the whole army. Just uh, we don't want to make the, 
the people labor and work hard. All we need is a few to take the city. And so they went up thither, thither the people, about 3,000 men, and they were defeated. They just had this incredible supernatural victory in Jericho, and now they're defeated in Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and six men. And they chased them from, from before the gate, even unto Shebarim. They chased them, they humiliated them. They didn't defeat them in a hand-to-hand -hand battle. They chased them, the men ran. So now we see weakness in the men of Israel and fear of the enemy. Why? Because Jehovah's strength in them had leaked out or was leaking out and they didn't even know it, like Tony's dream. And, ch and they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. They were terrified. So that's Tony's dream, the water leaking out is the braveness and the boldness and the power of the Spirit of God leaking out, resulting in fear and defeat in the everyday battles of life. That, fil that filters down to your ministry, to a family, your place of business. You bring the curse wherever you go. And the manifestation of the curse is defeat before your enemies. What a responsibility, brethren. We need to know what our responsibilities are. We are not an island. We do not live alone. When we sin, we affect everybody in our lives, and in particular, the lives and institutions that we have authority over. If you're the only believer in your place of employment and you sin, the place of your place of, empo of employment right, will feel will feel it. It just occurred to me now what someone in the ministry was telling me that how the money just keeps coming into their place of employment. And it looked it looked uh, on the surface that it was this one person. And we're trying to figure out what is it about this person that money just finds him. Well, it's not that person. It's the believer. It's the believer that does not have a, a the top position in the company. The very presence of the believer in the company will prosper the company. If you, brethren, if you have this anointing, you are the salt of your company whether it's blessed or cursed by God. I, I don't know how to make it any clearer. We're a walking, we're either a walking blessing or a walking time bomb. Sorry, my, my program closed. Please give me a minute. And the people's bravery turned to fear. Their hearts melted and they turned to water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, did he blame it on Satan? Joshua said, alas, O Lord God, Alas, Elohim, Jehovah, why have you brought this people over Jordan? Why have you brought us to this high place of the spirit to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? We were content with the Holy Spirit. We didn't need to come over into this esoteric doctrine. Why are we being destroyed in this high place? Well, to God, we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns their back 
Israel turns their back before the enemies. What has happened to these brave men of God? They've lost their guts. They've lost their power. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us round and cut off our name from the earth. And what will I do unto what will you do unto your great name? In other words, if we're defeated and we're all killed, okay, who will be the vessels that you will be revealed through in this world? Brethren, we do not live for ourselves. We are the vehicles of the expression of Almighty God in the process of being formed and defended to the point that the fullness can live in us without killing us. We are his only expression in this world. Human beings. And we do not belong to ourselves. And if you think you can willfully sin, you are about to find out how wrong you are. Am I threatening you? Yes, because I read the scripture. Am I going to do something to you? No, I'm not doing anything to you. I'm afraid for you. And Jehovah said unto Joshua, get up. Why are you lying upon your face? That's what he said to Moses when Moses stood at the Red Sea and didn't know what to do. Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even amongst their own stuff. They've not only taken it, they not only touched the unclean thing. Look at, look at the progression. You touch the unclean, you were commanded to not even touch it. You touch the un unclean thing. You took it and it's considered stolen because you had no right to it. And I don't know what the word dissembled means. And as if that was not bad enough, they made it their own. They've joined themselves to it. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will, be, will I be with you anymore, the whole nation of Israel. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed thing from amongst you. That means either the person in sin gets rid of the cursed object or the person gets separated from Israel. I'm not doing anything. I'm waiting and watching. Joshua chapter 7, verse 12. If you think I'm going to let this whole ministry be cursed, you are very mistaken. But right now, the Lord's not telling me to do anything. Anything I do will come from the Lord alone. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed thing from amongst you. Up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. But thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of you, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households. And the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. He and all that he has 
because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has wrought folly in Israel. I'm not sure what that burnt with fire means, but I think that it means execution and the body burned. Why would the body be burnt? Because it has to be a spirit of witchcraft operating in you to so willfully, um, so to so willfully disregard the direct commandment of the Lord. So listen, brethren, this is not a baby ministry. I'm not doing anything. I'm reading the scripture to you. Do you understand that these things don't happen in the church today because the church is so far away from God? We live the scripture in this ministry. The scripture is alive in this ministry. The judgment for touching the accursed thing, the judgment for touching what God has specifically told you not to touch is death. In the Old Testament, does it mean spiritual death or physical death? I don't know, but it means one of the two. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah and he took the family of the Zerahites, the descendants of Zerah. And, the, and he brought the family out of the Zerahites man by man and Zabdi was taken. This is all being done by the spirit. That's how powerful the spirit of God was in Israel with Joshua. It's like, this doesn't happen in your typical Pentecostal church. And if it does happen, it happens very slowly. I saw it happen in Gospel Revivals. That church was alive with the most incredible experiences um, Service after service after service, the most incredible manifestations of the power of God in that church. And it happened slowly. First, the anointing left. And then what happens is that you don't believe it. The people didn't believe it. I guess the pastor didn't believe it. I know one woman came to me and told me how depressed she was. And I asked her, do you know that the anointing left the church? And she said, no, I didn't know that. So then after the anointing left, then the people started leaving. Then the congregation got smaller and smaller. Then he couldn't afford to pay the bills anymore. Finally, he sold the building after a long time. To his credit, he wouldn't sell the building to a Buddhist temple. Then he moved the, the ministry into his house. And then he died physically. And then his wife died. Too young. In his 60s, I guess. Am I trying to scare you? You want to be Israel? You want longevity? We have to walk in the fire. Israel walks in the fire. We know the truth. That the church has no fear of sin. To walk to walk in this ministry and have no fear of sin. What is wrong with you? We'll see what the Lord does about it. We'll see what the Lord's going to do. I'm watching because I need to know, I need to understand. I need to know what to anticipate. Listen, the scripture says that the man under Moses' rule was, was um, gathering sticks on the Sabbath. And Moses didn't know, either didn't know what to do or didn't want to take it upon himself to do it. Moses asked Jehovah, what do I do? He's violating the law that you gave me that I wrote down in the book. Do you think Moses didn't know what to do? The judgment was death, but he didn't want to do it on his own. He asked the Lord. Well, do you think the man was really just gathering firewood? No, he was manifesting some kind of witchcraft. The 
higher we get, the less sin is tolerated. Now, in this in this dispensation, I, I don't my my opinion. If, the, the, if repentance doesn't come forth and the cursed object is not given up, that the person will be separated from the ministry. That's my my opinion. But I'm not do, I'm not doing anything. I'm watching and waiting for God to see what He's going to do. All that I know is that if I have anything to say about it, this ministry will not pay the price for that sin. If I have anything to say about it at all. I'm, I'm not the one that you have to flatter. I'm not the one that you have to control. I'm not the one that you have to convince that what you're doing is okay. No. You have to convince the Lord who has already shed his ears to you. And verse uh, 19, And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, Give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, give the glory to God. Would you come out of this rebellion? <laughs> give the glory to God and make a confession unto him. Tell him what you've done and don't hide it from me either. Don't insult my intelligence. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, I coveted them. So we see that jealousy, covetousness is the source of disobedience to God. There's something that you want that God said, don't touch it, but you coveted it and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent. I, I, it's, it's, it's uh, hidden in, in, in your personality, joined to your personality, in the midst of your tent, which is your physical body, and the silver is under it. Your salvation is now underneath the sin. <laughs> that which is in you, which is the lower part of the white drop that has the ability okay, to, to commune with God is now under the authority of the cursed thing in your own mind. You've been overtaken in your mind by the cursed object. So Joshua sent messengers and ran, they ran unto the tent. And behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver was under it. So there have been witnesses to this. It's not just me. They've looked and they've seen that your salvation is covered over. Six witnesses. Six witnesses. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them to Joshua and unto the children and all the children of Israel and laid them out before Jehovah. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment. So you see, you've covered yourself, you've covered your salvation with an unholy garment. And now you've become a hypocrite. And the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, the whole thing. The whole family, the whole family came under the judgment, just like with Korah. They took Achan, the son of Zerah, 
and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent, his body, and all that they had. And they brought them and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? Why have you brought this trouble to Israel? Well, we already know. It was covetousness. You saw something that you wanted and you took it. <laughs> Even though the Lord said not to touch it. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? And Jehovah said, I'm sorry, Joshua said, why have you troubled us? Jehovah shall trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones. And after they were dead, I believe, burned them with fire. And after they had stoned them with stones, they burned them with fire. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Next, the scripture that I have for you is Genesis 25, 31. Genesis 25, 31. And this is about Jacob and Esau. We'll start with 26, the two brothers. No, the first one that came out was 25. And, well, they, 24. And when Rebecca's days were numbered, when, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, Behold, there were twins in her womb, and we all, we all have twins, okay? Cain and Abel are our twins, or the son of man, or the son of perdition, are our twins. And the first came out red, the first that came out was that, that which was one of the red drop, okay? That's the sin in your mind. All over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau, that's your sin nature. And after that came out his brother and his hand took hold on Esau's heel and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score or 60 years old when Rebekah bare the twins, one from the red drop and the other from the white drop. Cain and Abel. And the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter a man of the field, your fallen, our fallen nature is a hunter. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Well, the, 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 the depth of that verse is that the fallen nature is a hunter. We hunt so, that's our fallen nature, brother. The, 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 that's expressed by the phrase, and what's in it for me? I'll be nice to you, but what's in it for me? But the plain man, he's the man that's in the scripture all the time. He's the man that's seeking God all the time. So the two brothers typify the old man and the new man, that which is born of the red drop and that which is born of the white drop. Are we a hunter of souls? Do we do everything because of what's in it for us? Are we satisfying ourselves? and putting everyone around us that trusts us at risk? Are we a plain man seeks the word of God? Obviously we go back and forth, who are you today? And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. What does that mean? 
He was a, Isaac was a carnal man. He preferred, he, he had something, he was more in, had more in common with the man that lived out of his soul, that lived out of the flesh. Isaac was, and we told in another place that Isaac's eye was dim. His ability to see in the spirit was very dim because he was carnal. And he had a rapport, more of a rapport with his son Esau, because he did eat of his venison. Well, in the natural, what does that mean? Well, because they both loved flesh. They were both flesh. That's what they had in common. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Rebecca had a soul time with Jacob. And Jacob boiled pottage, bringing forth the word of God. And Esau came from the field. And he was faint. It was Esau. It was the whole family spiritual. Isaac and Jacob and Esau, they all, they all have the spiritual heritage of Abraham. And when you're spiritual and you live a carnal life, the day comes that you're fainting. You may not know what's wrong in your life. You may say, there's something wrong in my life. I don't know what's wrong in my life. You're dying for the outpouring of the spirit. You're dying for the word of God because you've spent all of your energy on the flesh. So what is that telling us? That you take your mind off of the spirit and you give all of your energy to the flesh. You give 95% of your energy to the flesh. You're now joined to the flesh. You're now joined to the red drop. You're given over to the red drop. And if you're not starving now, you will be starving. At some point, at some point, you will realize that you're starving because you can't have both. See, you cannot move in the anointing and continue to possess the accursed object. You cannot have both. You think you can have both. You cannot have both. And if you don't believe that now, you will find out that you cannot have both. When you wake up in the pig pen, and I don't know how long that will take, this, this is the hour that the Lord is about to appear in this ministry. The whole world is on the tip of a pin, on the verge of great major changes in the world, in the church, in the individual, in this ministry. And this is the time you're going to go and find yourself. By the time you wake up in the pig pen, everything may be over. And apparently it's your choice. And Jacob boiled pottage. He brought forth the word of God and Esau came in from the field and he was fainting because all of his energy was given to carnal things. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray you, with that same red pottage for I am faint. And therefore his name was called Edom. Edom means red. And Jacob said, sell me this day your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. And what point shall this birthright do to me? I am in such pain and in such emotional need. I need to be satisfied now, here and now, right now. And what good does my heritage in the Lord, what good does my anointing do? if I'm starving and cannot function in this world because of the pain that I'm in. Brethren, it's called Armageddon. That's Jesus on the cross. I mentioned it in session one. Everybody will not experience it in the same way, but we will all come to that crossroads where we will be in such a state of need that the temptation to satisfy ourselves with the things of this world will be very great. Why? Because we're dying to this world. We're, the, degree, the, the degree to which the Son of Man is developed in you if, you, if you, if you're receiving this doctrine, he's at least begun to be born in you. Okay. He has risen up to the, to the Father 
for this doctrine and is breaking to pieces your relationship with your own soul. And your own soul gives you perceptions and thoughts that are selfish. They're for you only. They're not the thoughts of God. So it's, we have a desert experience. We all have to have the desert experience where we're starving. We're starving. I went for years with emotional starvation. We're supposed to feed on the word of God. We're supposed to survive the pain. It's a crucifixion. It's a circumcision. It's the circumcision of our heart. It's the cutting away of the flesh. There is no circumcision without pain. And the circumcision reveals the, the life of God in us. The, cir the circumcision reveals Abel. It's the resurrection of Abel. You cannot separate the resurrection of Abel from the circumcision or the crucifixion. The old man has to be we have, we are codependent with our own fallen nature. Our personality is codependent with our own fallen nature. She comforts us. Well, you have to let go of her to be joined to God. You know what this is like? This is like the man or, or the woman who's uh, very unhappy in their marriage. And they say, well, I'll get someone else before I divorce. If it's a, if it's a woman, if it's a man, I'll say, I'll get myself a woman, okay? I'll get her on the side. I'll just be having an affair. My wife won't know about it. And when I figure out that she's the one that I really would like to replace my wife, you know, then I'll tell my wife I'm going to get a divorce. And on the day that the, that the judgment of divorce is final, I'm going to marry this new woman. <laughs> Brethren, we're all going to face this if we're not facing it already. This walk is painful. Who will satisfy you? The flesh or God? Will you tolerate the wilderness experience to have the greatness satisfy you? Or will you find it intolerable and be the third person in Pastor Copiston's dream? He says, I can't bear it. I don't want to, I don't want to bear it, just let me die. Let me die to the anointing. Okay. I will choose the satisfaction of this world over the anointing. And what is my job? And what is the job of the six witnesses? To tell you, if you think you can have both, you are deceived and have received a lie. It may look like you can have both, but you cannot, cannot have both. If you will not let go of the accursed thing, you have made your choice and the anointing will leak out of you until it's completely dissipated and you are spiritually dead. Excuse me, brethren, while I drink, while I'm preaching to you today. It's an illusion that you can have both. And if you think that you can go to the point of almost death and change your mind okay, and then get rid of the accursed thing and think that you will be back where you fell from overnight, you're mistaken about that also. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point of going to die. You're not going to die. You just think you're going to die. It just feels like you're going to die, but you won't die. What profit shall this birthright in Christ Jesus do for me? And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. That's like the man that had the talent that he, he buried in the earth and he lost it completely. 
So your spiritual inheritance will go to the man with the word of God. See, what it doesn't say in this account, because it's in, it's in a parable form, what it doesn't say is that Esau had a choice. Esau's grandfather was Abraham. Abraham was still alive. And Isaac knew the word of God, see. What it doesn't say here is that Esau could have repented. He could have repented that he spent all of his substance on carnal things. And now he had a now he had suddenly had a spiritual need that that would not be satisfied by something like mana. In other words, he woke up, he woke up one day that he had a spiritual need. Okay? And and you have to start small. So we don't know what happened here, brother. I have to fill it in by, by what the Lord's giving me and by what's in my heart. He woke up one day and he realized that he was a carnal man and that he was lacking spirituality. And that this, and he found out that this, and he realized the spirituality was in the word. And he wanted to get it all at once and he couldn't. It was like the Hebrew children in the wilderness with the money. It was just like a little mushroom, they say. You know, I remember my father, okay? This is what comes to mind. I was already uh, working, I guess. In any event, I knew how to type. It was before computers, brethren. And my father wanted to try to get, uh, to take, uh, to get um, a promotion in his job, and he wanted to learn how to type. I said, okay, dear, this is what you do. Does anyone here know how to type? This is how they teach you. A, 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 well, that's not an A. J, 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 D, D, D. That's how you learn what the letters are. You know what I'm talking about. And he started, and he got mad at me. He got mad at me. He said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I said, well, dear, that's how you learn to type. I don't know how else to tell you. And he got up, and he wouldn't even try. He would not do it. He would not do the dot, dot, dot. Da, da, da. He wouldn't do it. He said, I'm dying. I feel like I'm dying. I realized that I have that I have this spiritual need. I didn't know I had a spiritual need before. And I think I'm going to die without it. And I don't have time to read the word. I don't have time uh, to, to listen to four hour messages. I'm going to go and give up all of my spiritual substance just for immediate satisfaction. And although, although Jacob was a holy man, this is manifested in the world in the form of going to the witch to get yourself satisfied. He could have repented. He could have repented and thrown himself on the mercy of his father and his grandfather. But he didn't do that. He said, I'm gonna to go to my brother, see? I won't, I won't ask my father and my grandfather for help. I won't admit my weaknesses to them. Okay? I'm going to go to my brother who's been studying with God and has an anointing. And uh, I'm going to get it from him. And his brother said to him, I'll give you the word. You know? I'll give you the word, but you have to, you have to give your soul over here. You have to give your, your inheritance over here. See. But what happened in the, in, the, in the parable, which is a historical account, okay, is that Esau gave it all away and then, and then wanted to murder Jacob. But if you want, everything needs to be applied to the person here and now. That's what, that's what the Lord's telling us. We want to learn and we want to grow. Everything in the scripture needs to be applied to whoever's listening to this message. So what is the truth of Esau? He came to a ministry like this. I even remember in Pastor Holt's houses, people would come in, it was a deliverance ministry. And they would come in with all kinds of problems and they would want him to pray for them and expect a deliverance. And he would tell them, come in, sit down, stay for the whole service, let the anointing fall on you. You have a, a deep problem, join the ministry, join the ministry. Come to service three, four times a week, join the ministry. Submit yourself to God. That's what they tell you in the self-help groups, drug addicts, uh, alcohols, and animals, whatever, whatever self-help group you're in. You're desperate, come in, 
attend the meetings, make the coffee, you know, be a servant, get yourself a sponsor, talk it out, and you will heal little by little. Esau didn't want to do that. So, although Jacob was a holy man, okay, in our life, the way it would work out would be that the person that would do that would rather go to someone who was a witch that says, I can pray a prayer over you and take that need away from you. I'll make that alcoholism go away. I'll make that addiction go away. Okay, Just give me your money and you sell your spiritual substance to that witch. But then I ministered to a man a long time ago. Before the before the ministry started, a long time ago, like 35 years ago, um, the Lord connected me with this woman who lived in Howard Beach. And I guess I was a Christian already. And um, I think I had just gotten out of the hospital. I had my three months in the hospital shortly thereafter. And I wasn't holding any meetings at the time. She was introducing me to all of her neighbors and Howard Beach uh, uh, as a woman of God. And she took me to the house of this, this man. He was in his 60s. He was living with his sister, just he and his sister. And he needed deliverance. I'm sorry, I don't remember what was wrong with him. But he needed deliverance. So I was right out of gospel revivals at the time. And so I was really sharp with the deliverance. And I said to him, I tried to find out what the issue was. I tried to find out what the curse was. So I questioned him. And I couldn't get, I didn't get any response in my heart of what curse to break. So I told him I was sorry and I was leaving. And then he suddenly wouldn't let me go and confessed to me that when he was a young man, now he's in his 60s now, when he was a young man, I don't know, early teens, yeah, still in his parents' home, he became a hopeless alcoholic. And he would get drunk and just pass out on the bed and was literally worthless. His, he was Italian, and his parents were Italian immigrants. And the only thing they knew to him to help him was to go to the local witch, because uh, there were not only Italians, but a lot of immigrants that came over from Europe. They believed in witchcraft. Well, the parents went to this local witch, okay, and she gave him a potion, and it had her menstrual blood in it. And he drank it. And he was completely healed of alcoholism, completely healed of alcoholism as a teenager. And here he was in his 60s with a serious problem that I don't remember what it was. So when I heard that, I broke the curse. And of course, the Lord was with me. I broke the curse and I prayed for him. And I'm waiting to see a manifestation. And nothing happened. So I said, well, I, I, did, I did all I could do for you. you know, I'm glad that you told me that, that you, you need to confess that that was a sin, that you healed, mm -hmm. you took a healing potion from a witch, you know, uh, instead of going to the Lord. And, and he might have said to me, but I didn't know how to go to the Lord in those days. It doesn't matter. You went to a witch for a healing potion and she gave you a drink with her menstrual blood and you were healed instantly. And now it's caught up to you all these years later. And I've done all I could do for you. So I called him the next day to find out how he was doing. And he told me that he was up all night. He had a pot by the bed. He was vomiting all night, getting deliverance. It was a delayed reaction. So 40 years, 40 years later, that curse would would I don't know, I don't remember, I don't remember what was wrong with him. But he was delivered through Jesus Christ all those years later. So we have people, see. They want to keep their sin and they want power. So they go to a witch or they go to a ministry that does not require you to confess your sins. And they, they, want, do they want doctrine. There are people that like doctrine. There are, there are multiple uh, 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 organizations out there that have esoteric doctrine that do not require you to confess your sins. Most churches today don't require you to confess your sins for the whatever anointing is there. So Esau had an option. He could have 
subjecting himself to his father, not his father, his grandfather, confessed his sins, endured the pain, and built up the, the, the power of God in him slowly. But he didn't do that. And it seems to me, as the way the Lord is, is giving us this understanding right now, I would have to say, you know, he must have left, he, in order for this to happen, in order for him to give up his inheritance, he, he had to, um, I don't know if you show it to me. He had to have had an alternative. So I'm believing he went to Abraham. Abraham said, repent, and I'll teach you, and come every day for your lessons, and we'll build up God in you. And he said, no way. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to Jacob. And the Lord, the Lord being in control of the whole thing, knew that Esau was a profane man and was going to give away the inheritance that he had, which was the inheritance of Israel. This man was an important Esau was the firstborn of, of Isaac. He was carrying the inheritance of Israel. So Jehovah directed him, see, seeing the man's character and knowing what he would do, he directed him rather than to a witch who would have given him relief, he directed him to his brother and took of Esau's anointing and gave it to Jacob. So did this really happen in the natural? I don't know. But the message is, the message is that we're told about it in Hebrews 12, verse 16, that Esau was a profane man that had no respect for his spiritual inheritance. So God took it from him and gave it to his brother. That's scriptural. But it had to play out in a human way. And I suggest to you, under the anointing, maybe this is a parable too, that he went to Abraham and he would not take Abraham's advice but he just wanted that spiritual satisfaction immediately. And he gave away his potential. He, he, what, what, did he, what did he receive from, from Jacob? Maybe he received the Holy Spirit, but gave away the power to have God appear in him in the fullness. But then we have to ask all these questions. Do you really think that he gave away his spiritual inheritance for a for a bowl of lentils. Do you really believe that? No, I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. The pottage that he took was red. He took from the red drop of Jacob. He took from the red drop of Jacob, the Bible scholar. He didn't take the esoteric doctrine. He took something that came out of the natural man. And Jacob got his spiritual inheritance. And the Lord was in control of the whole thing because he knew that Esau was a profane man. Let's read it out in uh, Hebrews 12:16. This is Paul talking about peaceable fruit. Okay, let's let's take the whole chapter here. Why not? We have nothing else to do today. Hebrews chapter 12. Paul speaking. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, and now we know that the cloud is the spiritual seminal fluid. And uh, when I looked at witnesses, I just saw white. Okay, so... This cloud of witnesses is all of the people that have the, the beginnings of the white drop. So now that we're compassed about, what does that mean? Our red drop, our red drop is, which is destroying us with false perceptions, is now surrounded by the power of the white drop that's been imparted to us. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. 
So now that we have received the beginnings of the white drop appearing in this world, which is surrounding the red drop and cutting off the destructive perceptions, let us cease from sin. That so easily comes upon us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The race is, can the fullness of the Godhead enter into our body before our bodies die from natural causes? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The joy of being the fullness of the Godhead. Well, he already was the fullness of the Godhead body, of being of having the full deliverance of which includes separation from a, a corrupt body. And of course, his whole experience as a glorified man. He endured the cross. Well, we each have a cross, brethren. We each have a desert experience. We each have a cross. There is no way to inherit the promises, which, which, is, which promises come in the form of the birth of the Son of Man. There is no way to have the baby without pain. Every man has his cross to bear. If you won't bear the pain, the scripture says you're a reprobate. And Christ was never in you. It was a phony from the whole time. I'm, I'm telling you the scripture. Is that true about you? I don't know. You answer the question. Every one of you answer for yourself. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. I'm not sure what that means, contradiction of sinners against himself. But it's what it's saying is, look at what he endured, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. Don't faint, brethren. Do not faint. That's the commandment. Do not faint from the pain. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. See? We're all striving against sin from the day that the Lord uh, established a relationship with us. So no matter how painful Resisting sin is, you have not yet endured uh, what would be the equivalent of the, of the crucifixion of Jesus. It hasn't drawn your blood. You have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. So you think that it's killing you. You think you can't survive, but it's a lie. I, I only have one child and I had a cesarean section, but I'm told that women in the late room curse their husbands. Some of them curse God. Yeah. I remember seeing my niece. She was beat up really bad, but she had the baby and it passed. Well, Sheila, how can you talk if you didn't have a natural birth? I had other issues, brethren. I've almost died multiple times. And, this, and you do, and the cesarean section is, is, is a surgery, but it's a different kind of pain. It's painful separating from our fallen nature. It's wonderful. We hear the word of God, we experience the spirit of God, and we embrace him gladly and with joy. And what happens when you feel the pain? Will you remain faithful when you feel the pain? Or will you receive the satisfaction of your fallen nature? Will you let the snake satisfy you? And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, Despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receives. 
What that means is separating from your sin nature is no fun. If you endure chastening, because every pain that we experience is a chastening of the Lord. Now, you may have to be spiritual to understand that. It may look like your pain has arisen out of a condition that you have no control over. But every, everything that's not pleasant is a chastening of the Lord. That's the, that's the spiritual reality of our existence. We are our higher soul <laughs> learning how to live in the body and without the body or the beast taking authority over us. That's who we are, brethren, that's who we are. <laughs> People that do not have the Lord yet, they're just the beast. That's they, the people that don't have the Lord yet, you know who they are? They are the red drop that failed to rule over the bestial nature and are now the slaves of the beast. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, okay, you are now a higher soul, a higher soul, okay, that is learning to live in the body without the beast nature taking you over. And everything that happens to you is a chastening of that soul part of righteous Adam who failed to hold the line. Every painful thing that happens to you is a chastening of the natural man who's living the existence of a beast because in the spiritual dimension, his potential to do otherwise called the red drop succumb to the sins of the best your man. Did you understand that? Okay. We'll say it again. Every painful thing that happens to us in this world okay, is the result of The red drop, which every human being has, which is our potential to live above pain, having succumbed to the passions of the beast. It is the beast that is chastened. It is the bestial Adam that is chastened. The man rides the horse. He hopefully he won't be too unkind to the horse, but you either pull on the reins or you, you, you have to, you know, Tell the horse which way to go. Touch him with your spur, touch him with the crop. It's the beast that is being chastened. So the only reason we're being chastened is that the rider of the horse, which is the red drop, has succumbed to the power of the beast. And the beast is riding the man. Did you hear what I said? If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with a son. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, everyone is chastised, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they verily, for a few days, chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, for our profit, might, that we might be partakers of holiness. Your pain is that you might be partakers of holiness. By resisting the pain and waiting in pain until God satisfies you. Now, Verse 11, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. What does that mean? Unto them that learn from the pain. But if you yield to the pain and let the beast make you feel better, 
You won't learn anything. So it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness when you overcome. If you overcome. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down. Hands mean mind. Raise your mind up above the bestial perceptions. And lift up the feeble knees. The feeble knee is your car mind. The knees represent the mind. And make straight paths for your feet. Don't let your car mind rule you. Because if you do, that which is lame will be turned out of the way rather than be healed. Let God chasten you. Let God exercise you. Tolerate the pain and learn from it because it will lift up your mind when you seek God. Okay? It will raise up your mind. It will raise up your spiritual strength and it will make your carnal mind to walk the straight path which is a good thing, because if you don't do that, if the lame is not turned out of the way, if you continue to follow the path of the lame, rather than be healed, you will, be, you will not be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You shall not see the Lord without holiness. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby you might be defiled. Are you bitter because of the pain? Are you bitter because the Lord has not provided a way of escape that is acceptable to you or quickly enough for you? To do these things, follow peace with all men, lift up your hands, strengthen the feeble needs, etc., etc. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, such as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For one moment of satisfaction, he sold his birthright. For not willing to wait, not being willing to wait it out, and letting God satisfy him. Because you know how that afterward, after he gave up his birthright, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. In other words, if he didn't give up his birthright, he might have received the blessing. Jacob might not have gotten the blessing if Esau had not sold his birthright. But by selling his birthright, he showed himself not worthy of the blessing. For you know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected because he was rejected because he was rejected because he found no place of repentance. He was rejected because he found no repentance. Although he sought it carefully with tears, it was too late. You are not come unto the mountain that might be touched and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the words, which voice they that heard entered entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. That's the third woman in Pastor Crobuston's dream. Don't let Jehovah speak to us. We'll surely die if we hear this word. You've not come to that place. You've not come to the foot of Sinai, which was such a frightening experience. And then we told a comment about the Israelites, for they could not endure that which was commanded. They couldn't, they couldn't bear. They couldn't bear to hear what was commanded of them. It was it's too hard. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with the dark. 
they couldn't bear this thought that if you make a little slip that you die. But then this was this was the law that the Israelites that came to Mount Sinai were put under. Achan died and his wife and his children. What did he do? What did he do? He took a garment, he took a piece, a piece of cloth and some silver and he and his whole family died. The higher you get in God, the more stringent the judgments when you disobey. Well, the Hebrew children at the foot of Mount Sinai, they couldn't bear what they were. They couldn't live with such a law that they do one little thing wrong. It wasn't such a little thing wrong, but he made a mistake. Maybe he didn't hear Joshua when he was saying that. <laughs> Don't touch anything. Maybe he didn't hear it. Maybe he was daydreaming about his wife and he didn't hear it. And then he and his whole family died. They couldn't bear it. Well, brother, you, you want to walk in the fire? You, you want power with God? You want immortality? That's, that's how we walk. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Well, that's interesting. Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. <laughs> Moses, who saw God face to face. Well, he didn't see him face to face. He just saw his hind parts on the top of the mountain. Moses, well, Moses didn't make it. He didn't enter in. Have you no fear of God? If you're not repentant, it means you have no fear of God. So what does that mean? It means, how do you have no fear of God? It means you're completely given over to a mindset that doesn't know him. And then the anointing that you have had begins to leak away. But that's not for you, brethren. You come to Mount Zion. We're not, we come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. That's not you, that you're gonna be thrust through with a dart you know, and those severe judgments. You've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels and the angels are in the people. to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. We have the Lord Jesus Christ to cover our sins and to get us through. Who can endure the law? No one can endure the law. Everybody dies from it. Brethren, every member of Israel, including Moses and Aaron, died because they couldn't, they violated the law. Who can keep the law? It can't be kept, you see. So here we are climbing into Pardis, and we're all sinners. We're, we're, we're all sinners. Our red drop is still manifesting in areas of our life. And yet we're climbing into Pardis, we're climbing up to, up to Mount Zion. And we don't have to shiver and shake and be exceedingly fearful of the judgments of God. All we have to do is repent. Esau repented and it didn't do him any good. All we have to do is repent. We've got it much easier than the Hebrew children. You know, the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Jesus is the first one to be born out of death. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men. 
to the spirits of justified men made perfect. To the spirits of Adam that are justified and made perfect. And those are the soul parts of righteous of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to Jesus, that's actually Christ Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Well, he's in, inside of us, he's Christ Jesus. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that's Christ, his blood, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Abel was buried by Cain. The blood of Jesus can never turn. Cain will never overtake Abel in, in the blood of Jesus. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. When it spoke on earth was Moses. And they didn't escape, they all died. How much more shall we not escape? We turn away from the one who speaks from heaven, which is Christ Jesus. So don't refuse him that speaks. I'm going to do this again. This is what the Israelites had to deal with. Paul is saying, verse 18, you're not, you have not come to the place that you're at now okay, by being at the foot of the mountain that might not be touched. Don't let the people come close to them. If they get too close to God, they'll die. You're not in a relationship where you cannot be touched because if you're touched, you'll die. In a spiritual place that burned with fire, which is judgment. Nor, nor into the blackness and the darkness and the tempest of the power of God that made a covenant with you that scared you after death. To the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word not be spoken to them anymore. Moses, don't let God talk anymore. We can't bear what he's saying. For they could not endure that which was commanded of them. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, if your, if your carnal nature so much as touched the spirit of God, it shall be stoned or thrust through with the door. When you're in the presence of God, this is national Israel, if any part of their fallen nature appeared, they would have been destroyed, like, like Achan. That's not what we're called to. It was so terrible, it was such a terrible sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake when Moses was drawn close to simply the hind parts of Jehovah. That's how powerful Jehovah is. And there's no fear of him. But that's not us today. We, we have a better testimony than Abel who was overtaken by the beast. But you will come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, that's the higher soul, Adam, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, that's, um, I, I guess it's the, the, the lower part of the white drop in us, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the spirits of Adam that, to the spirits of the justified Adam who was made perfect, the soul parts of the glorified Jesus Christ. And we come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, that we don't have to be afraid like that, but we go on to the opposite extreme. We don't have to be afraid anymore, so we've lost all fear of God. And the only reason the church has lost the fear of God is that they don't understand his judgment. They blame it on Satan.
Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, into the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than Abel. It's the, it's the white, it's the white drop Abel that will not be overcome by the bestial nature. See that you refuse not the one that speaks. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, Moses, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh in heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised. His voice shook the earth with judgment, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. I will shake you physically, and I will shake you spiritually, and I will find out who you are. The judgment, the tests used to be in the flesh. All the tests were in the flesh. Touch not. Touch it and you die. Touch not. Today, the, the, test, the, the tests are in the flesh and in the spirit. I will shake your spiritual life. I will shake your agreement with the white drop. You were the personality that had been rejecting the red drop and embracing the white drop. I am going to shake that relationship. I'm going to bring you to a place where you will be so needy and the red drop will offer to satisfy your pain. And the white drop will say, I will satisfy your pain, but you must endure until I do. Will you leave the white drop? Will you be Esau? Will you sell your spiritual inheritance? Because once you do that, when you complete the act, okay, if you will not give up the accursed thing, once the anointing leaks out of you, I don't know that you could ever get it back. I'm reading from the scripture. Once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken. If you're shaken, you're removed. As of the things that are made, if the, if the shaking shakes you off of the tree, the shaking shakes you off of the tree, you're removed. You think you can have both, you're totally, completely deceived. Those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom, speaking to our higher soul, <laughs> the white trap, receiving us, the kingdom. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, what does that mean? It means the higher soul receiving a spiritual life, a personality which will not give up her union with that white drop for anything that the red drop has to offer. Wherefore we, the soul parts of the Lord Jesus Christ incarnate in the people, receiving a kingdom which are the people of personality and body, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Are you a kingdom that can be moved? Or a kingdom that cannot be moved? Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. That's the mother, Elohim, that came down with the tongues of fire on Pentecost. So, brethren, I guess God gave us another message. It's a serious day. Do you think that he's about to, is his near appearance in the earth? It's not a serious day. I'm really excited because in Pastor Kobus doing his dream, 
his dream, which is such a, a, an outstanding, obvious to me, work from the Lord, says that there is a small group in this country that will cross over without the severe judgment that the rest of the church will go through, whatever that's going to be. And I believe that we're all candidates for that promise. It was a, another witness outside of this ministry, outside of me preaching, it was another witness that there is a crossing over and it's imminent. Don't be shaking off the tree and become Esau. Because once that happens, once that small group crosses over without the judgment, the only way to go over will be with the judgment. A door will close. I've been preaching that for a long time. It's in his dream. The doorway to cross over without the fiery judgment, whatever that's going to be. The door will close. His third dream is talking really about the, the 10 virgins, the five that have the oil and five that don't have the oil. So, it's the Lord read it. A serious word, but how could it be any other way? Every one of us will be tested. Lord, any questions before we go? So glad the Lord showed up in full power. I'm not comfortable when he's preaching here, and I feel I'm not completely covered. My, my full age is not completely covered. I don't like it. Were you raising your hand? Um, yes, Ms. Deli had a question earlier yes. in the meeting. Yes. Um, she asks, how is the red drop different from the carnal wine? Oh, that's a good question. How is the red drop different from the carnal mind? The red drop is talking about the, um, the, the initial state. The red drop was breathed, is that, that's what Jehovah breathed into the man. Okay. And that red drop had two sides, spirit and seed. And, uh, and it materialized when that red drop joined with man, joins with man, it produces a mind. When I say red drop, it's like, um, uh, how can I say this? Uh, I'm talking about this pen, for example. And I don't, I never saw a pen before. I don't know what it is. What do I do with it? Can I eat it? What do I do with this pen? I don't know. It's worthless to me until I press the button and the point comes out and I try to write with it. See? Now, once I start to write with it, I can say, I, I can no longer call it a pen if I don't want to. I can call it a writing in, instrument. It's a writing instrument, I'm writing daily. Okay. But if I don't know that and it has no point and it's useless, then it's a pen. But it becomes a writing instrument when it starts to move in its function. So that's the best that I can do for you. That the red drop is it's, 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 it's um, it's, it's, it's basic state, like a, 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 um, an ovum in, in, your, in your body. Yeah. And then when it combines with the human being, it becomes a mind. And it either becomes, it either becomes the, the word and the spirit and in the individual, or it becomes Satan and the devil, which is the carnal mind. Satan and the devil is the carnal mind. So. So the red drop is, is not yet proven, okay, whether it will rule over the bestial nature. The red drop is the, the breath that's just breathed in, and now we're watching and we're going to see, will it rule over the bestial nature? When the red drop fails to rule over the bestial nature, okay, it takes on the nature of the beast and becomes the carnal mind, which is Satan and the body thing. If you didn't understand it, tell me and I'll do it again. I might take her a little bit to type in, so I'm delayed. Maybe. Um, 
Maybe I'll just do it again anyway for everybody. I'll just do it again anyway. The red drop is the is the is the basic condition of what is given to us from God. Right? Then when it joins with the human being, okay, it becomes a mind. And the question is, will that mind submit to the mind of God and be a righteous mind? Or will it turn its back on God? and become the carnal mind. And what makes it the carnal mind is that it's refusing the perceptions of God. It's turning its back on God and the and it's giving its own perceptions to the personality, which is us. That's when it's a carnal mind. When it, when it turns around and faces Jesus and admits that Jesus's ideas and Jesus's perceptions are superior and transfers Jesus's perceptions to the personality then it's a righteous mind. Okay? When it stops doing that, when it transfers its own thoughts to the personality and takes and becomes the God of the personality, mm. blocking the personality's relationship with Jesus, mm. it becomes the carnal mind. Did she get it? I think so, because she typed in right when you started again. She said, please again, thank you. So I'm sure she got it. Okay, I think it came out better the second time. Mm. Um, there is a couple comments. Okay. Um, we have a visitor today. Um, the handle is Malik uh, Kushi, Kushi Music. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, but he said, beautiful message. Thank you. And Tony typed in um, the meaning of disassemble. Oh, if you were it? looking for that at some point. Yes, the message, thanks. it says, um, to hide under a false appearance, disassembling the facts. To be a hypocrite, in other words. Okay. Thank and, you, Tony. And then Rose at the beginning, um, she found uh, your comment in the video from Thursday that you were looking for. Oh, yes. What was it? God bless you, Rose. <laughs> I do appreciate you so much. She said, I asked the Lord to lead me to the place in the video where you mentioned what the church needs to believe to be fully saved in the flesh. It is at um, 43 minutes. And you said we need to know the truth about who we are, what our potential is, and what our choices are. Okay, 43 minutes in which message, Rose? Let's about who we are. Session one, she believes. Which message? Of, about the snake? About the snake. Part one session. Okay. okay, thank you so much. I love you all so much. I hope that it was never my intention to terrify anybody. It's a message from the Lord, and it's a message that has covered us from being um, a from uh, experiencing the judgment upon the person that's out of the way. For whom we pray that they take the victory and the victory is repentance. And there is no repentance as long as you retain the accursed garment. God bless you all. Love you so much. And uh, Lord willing, I will see you on Thursday. Bless you all.